I want you, if you wouldn't uh, mind, and we'll all agree with you, uh, I thank you for your presence on talk radio for 25 years. I thank you for, you know, pretty much uh, your pastoral role and good advice in my life. It's kind of like um, I, I can only say this. I thank God for you. I thank God for your wife. I thank God for your influence to the many lives you've touched. And and the Lord is taking you, Pastor Langford, to a worldwide audience. So I'd like you to pray, if you would, and we'll come against the evil powers coming against the people of God, and that God will strip the deceptive veil over the believer's eyes. So will you do that to launch us into the next two hours? Absolutely. Heavenly Father, we humbly come before the throne of grace, that we might find mercy and help at the time of trouble. Lord, our world is profusely perplexed in this hour. Men's hearts are failing them for fear, for they're looking after the things which are coming upon the earth. And the things that are coming upon the earth are going to be gruesome and very cruel and very demeaning, Lord. But we pray that the Holy Ghost of God would arise as the day star in our hearts, O God, and that your word would illuminate us, Lord, that we would not be men and women who sit in darkness, but that the light of Jesus Christ would arise upon us, Lord, and open our minds to the deep things of God. I pray tonight that the blood of Jesus Christ would be applied to this program, that the powers of darkness would have to wane and abate as we take the authority in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, to pronounce your word with clarity and with Holy Ghost conviction. I pray that the word of God would go forth tonight, that your word would find a lodging place, a place of residence in everyone's heart and everyone's mind. God, those who are listening tonight, who do not know you as Lord, as Savior, as Redeemer, I ask that they would come to that knowledge tonight. I pray there would be power in this program through the word of God and through the Holy Ghost, but I pray there would also be conviction conviction, yes, Lord. Lord, to direct those who are out there in a wayward path. They have gotten away from you, Lord. They may be backslidden. There may be those who are indifferent, those who, Lord, are lukewarm, those who have backslidden. Lord, there may be those who have not ever known you before. But I pray before the program comes to a close tonight that the great invitation that you gave many, many years ago when you said in Matthew 11 and 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I pray for the Hagmans. I pray for Doug. I pray for Joe. I pray for Renee. I pray for Eric. Lord, I, I, I pray that you would just touch everyone tonight. You touch John. You touch Todd, who helps us to hook up on the telephone lines, Lord. I just pray yes, that the Jesus. anointing and the spirit of grace will abound powerfully, Father. Now go with us and help us to be obedient to the leadership of your will tonight, Father. That's all we desire, that we might be conformed to the image of your Son, that we might be obedient to whatever you would have us to say, Father. We commit this program now in your hands and pray your will, will be done. And we ask it in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And David, I'm going to add to your prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we loose the warring angels of heaven, those who are assigned to the heirs of as those who are called to righteousness, Lord, that those angels, your warring angels, will be released in every believer's life that is listening to this broadcast tonight, Lord. Pastor Langford and I rebuke the powers of darkness and the birds of the air that will try and steal the word that's being planted. Lord, you said, not by might, nor by power, but by your spirit, saith the Lord. And God, we loose those warring angels to the people of God. We break away every curse upon them. We break away every evil spell, every evil word being spoken against even President Trump, Lord, and all the witches and all the warlocks and all we ask god that you stop the human sacrifices tonight we ask god that these men and women who are drinking feasting on innocent blood god that it literally coagulate in their throats and god you give them a vision of hell 
You give them a vision of hell. They want to live in Hollywood and want to continue in that, then God give them a vision of what their eternal fate is. You open, Lord, the literal land, God, and swallowed up entire populations of idolaters. Father, give the people that are so bloodthirsty in their lust. God, I pray you give them a vision of hell. And Lord, I bring South Africa before you tonight, Lord. Father, we ask that the spirit of murder of white farmers, God, would stop in that land, Lord. And of your believers, white and black, that is that are having murder, the spirit of murder, and we rebuke the spirit of murder off of South Africa, and God, I ask that you hide every man, woman, and child who is a believer in Jesus Christ, no matter what their color, from the devastation and from the evil that has been released against them. Lord, I remember on on Talk Radio 25 years ago, I said, as goes South Africa, so goes the United States. Lord, we watched it happen there, and we were silent. We watch it happen here, and we're also silent. God, we rebuke the spirit of rebellion, because your word says it is as sin as it is as the sin of witchcraft. And Father, we rebuke the spirit of rebellion over the United States of America. We rebuke the spirit of rebellion over South Africa in Jesus' name. And Father, I pray that you anoint your servant David tonight with that Rhema, God, from heaven, and we Thank you, Father, for our brethren, Lord, and our sisters all over the world, and their children, the offspring, the heritage of the Lord. God, put a defensive shield around them, I pray. Stop the murder in South Africa. Stop the murder in this country. And, Lord, I don't know how to say it in a nice way, but, Lord, let's steal literally uh, come into the anatomy of the men of God in this country, that they will rise up and take their position, just as David and his mighty men of valor. I ask this in Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. David, Amen. share what's on your heart. We just saw the situation in New York. Share what, as as you have so uh, so many times, where are we headed? Well, I want to begin tonight and make a pronouncement. Uh, Today's the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's famous posting of his 95 Theses in Latin on the Castle Church door at Wittenberg, Germany, on October the 31st, 1517. I know people are celebrating Halloween tonight, but I want to thank God for the revelation that Martin Luther received, that a man is justified by faith in God and God alone. As Steve just alluded to the fact that We saw another terrorist attack today in New York City. And I was thinking today as when when all the news media opened up this morning with their programs and dialogue, it was all about Halloween. Halloween symbolizes death and darkness. And I'm not here to castigate. When I was a little boy, uh, my grandparents took me trick-or-treating. Of course, it was nothing uh, like it is today, it was about getting candy. That's that's really what it was about in that day. But it's different today. It, it's it's because men are in darkness and they want the power of Satan, because that's why people covet power. They want this authority. They want this deity over other people's lives. And I was thinking about what uh, the Scripture says in John one verses four and five: In Him was life. And the light, life was the light of men, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The word light in the Greek is phos, uh, it's P-H-O-S. But phos is never kindled and never quenched. In other words, you cannot start the light of God, you cannot quench the light of God. In him was life, and the the light was the light of men. Jesus Christ is that light, and that's why everything that we're witnessing today is, is, is seething. It's creating a boiling point in this nation. I, I said it probably a year and a half ago. There is something coming. I don't know what it is. I have prayed. I have fasted. I've done everything I know to do to ask God to help me to know what this event is. I still cannot say what this event is, but I know there is an event coming that will make 9-11 be very insignificant, if I could so humbly say so. 
there's something out there that is very demonic. Uh, the darkness is rising. Men's hearts are becoming darker by the day our world leaders are being controlled by principalities and powers of the air. It was the prince or the demon of Persia uh, that was ruling uh, in the air during Daniel's time, and Daniel had to fast, and Daniel had to pray, and Gabriel told him, said, Daniel, from day one, your prayer was heard, but the prince of Persia withstood me, lo, 20 and one days, and he had to get Michael to war and fight the prince of Persia, so that Gabriel, who is a, a, an angel of messages, or a messenger angel, bring him the message and give him the understanding. And as men give themselves over to more evil, you will begin to sense evil as you never have sensed it before. Now, you're not going to sense that if you are sinful, if you're degraded and living a debased life, you're not going to sense that power of darkness like a Christian will. Why? Because it is an absolute conflict, light and darkness. We are children of the light, Paul said in the First Thessalonians 5. We are not children of the darkness. And regretfully, our world is becoming darker by the day. And we are told in Romans 13, 11, and that knowing the time, that now is high time to wake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The day is at hand. The night is far spent. In other words, we... We, we, we are in a, in, a, in a time of absolute darkness. I'm, I'm not trying to sensationalize anything here. But we are literally in a day of darkness, a, a day of profuse corruption. Uh, the, 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 the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. This is, this is what the Bible commands us to do. The day of the Lord is at hand, but, but the darkness ha has been overtaking the earth, you might say. And we're to cast off the works of darkness. And, and I know people, I hear it all the time uh, on television, radio, we're not supposed to judge. That, that's that's one, of the, one of the great fallacies in Christianity. If something is evil, I'm to declare it's evil, it's injurious, it is harmful, it is devastating. To sit there and be silent. And to say or do anything, I'm going to be held accountable for my negligence. I'm going to be held accountable for the souls of men that I should have warned about the coming judgment of God, but yet I wouldn't say anything because I didn't want to appear judgmental. Ezekiel would not have made it in this generation. He said, if you see the sword coming, and you don't warn the people, and they die in their sins, you're going to be accountable for their blood. And, and it's as though today in ministry, people don't care about the blood and the souls of men that are going to be eternally lost. I was sharing with my brother earlier today in a telephone conversation, Bert Clendenin. He's dead. He's gone now. But he was having a vision one day. In this vision, there's a man going through hell. He's reaching down into the flames of fire. He's grabbing men by the collar of their shirt, their suit, or whatever, and he's pulling them up out of the flames and looking at their face, and he kept saying, you're not the one, and would throw them back into the flames. He'd get another by the collar, pull him up and look at his face and say, you're not the one. This went on for several minutes, and Bert Clendenin said, God, what are you trying to show me? God said, that man is in hell looking for the preacher who lied to him. Now, you know, when you have a revelation or a vision, an experience like that from God, it is indelible. You never forget it. And when I hear men that I know that are men of God, I, I knew Burt Clendenin, a great man of God. He was an AG pastor, Assemblies of God. Great man of God, walked with God, had an anointing with God. When these men share these revelations, we ought to take heed. You see, even though God has already given us his word, he is so gracious through revelations, uh, through visions, through dreams, you know, to let us see more than what we are able to see in the natural. Why does God allow that? So we, we can be stirred so deeply in our hearts. Now, uh, Bert, having shared that vision, 
that God gave him was an impetus to me for me to say, I can never compromise the gospel of God. If I do, I will have blood on my hands. I don't want men, women alike, and I certainly don't want to go to hell myself, but I don't want to be a man where I have lived the life, have, have, have failed God to be faithful to my calling, and in hell men are looking for me. For what purpose? And I got to thinking about that. Why was this man looking for this lying preacher? Was he going to beat him? Was he going to malign him? Was he going to castigate? What was he going to do him? What was he going to do to him? Now you say, well, that, that's really crazy. I believe there will be mobs in hell beating other men such as that man because he lied. You know, you, you, you hear about pedophiles going into prisons, and the, 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 the prisoners beat them. They, 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 they hate them. They, they claim they have a certain standard uh, it, it, when people are incarcerated. Well, I, I do know that there were those who destroyed Jeffrey Dahmer after he got into prison. My point is, I believe we don't have a true concept of a literal hell and the things that go on in hell. And when we have a, a night like tonight, and this revelry, this reveling that's taking place, this, this, this partying, and it is sadistic. Say what you will, but it is sadistic. And, 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 and it's, a, it's a time of darkness. You know, Paul in Ephesians 5 and 11 said, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. You, you, you can't embrace darkness. If you do, your candle will go out in your life. When you get into sin and you depart from the faith of God, your candle of darkness goes out. That, that candle of light is none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Why do you think in Revelation 2, 4, and 5, he said, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. God will take that light out, because light and darkness cannot mix. It just It's impossible. It's amazing to walk into a dark room, turn the light on, and the darkness is dispelled. It is immediately gone. Where did it go? I don't know. But I know what caused it to leave was the light. And Jesus Christ is that light. John 8, 12, he said, I'm the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Uh, we talk about photosynthesis. What makes, out, even down to algae, what makes it grow? Light. You have to have light. And that light, I'm talking about spiritual light now, we must be illuminated by the light of God's Word and of God's Spirit. And yet, we're, do, we're seemingly doing everything that we can in the church world to put it out. You know, uh, I was thinking today, and I'm going to give it to you, Steve, millions will spend billions in costumes. But let a pastor call and say, instead of having a Halloween party tonight on the 31st of October, we want this to be a night of prayer, a night of consecration, a night of dedication, a night of supplication. Well, guess what? They're not going to show up. And you know why they're not going to show up? Because they're lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. I know as a pastor, having pastored for 27 years, 27 years I pastored, my weakest, most anemic service I ever had any time was when I called for a time of prayer. I could have a gospel singing. I, I could have a dinner, uh, a homecoming, a barbecue, cook, whatever you want to do. And people will flock out there but call for prayer. And everyone has an excuse and a reason. Prayer keeps that light burning and illuminated within your heart. And then when you're confronted with darkness... The light that is in you will show you the error of whatever you're dealing with, it, whether it's a person, a thing, a, a, a particular decision, whatever the case might be. And, and, as, and as the days get darker, we're going to have to do our part to keep our lamps trimmed and keep our lamps burning. When you go back and look at the five foolish virgins, what was the first thing they all did? They all arose and they trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil, for our lamps are going out. The Greek says, our lamps are gone out. 
But the wise said, no, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Why were they, why were they foolish? They didn't have the oil. They did not take the oil. The Bible said they took their lamps, but they didn't take any oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. They made sure they were going to have light. Now, this is, this is a spiritual application. It's also a literal one if you look at it in the natural of a wedding. Because nobody knew when the bridegroom would come. And, and, and because of that, it says, and the five of them were wise, and five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And, of course, the bridegroom tarried. They all slumbered and slept. And then, at midnight, a very dark time, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. All the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. But you see, the foolish didn't have the oil to sustain them. And while they went to buy, and that's a tragic story, then the reason why is they went to buy. The, the why I said to the foolish, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. I, I believe that is a veiled revelation of the mark of the beast. No man can buy or sell. See, he had the mark or the name or the number of the beast. These are the little things that people just read over. They don't get the revelation. They don't get the nugget there, and they just bypass it. God is warning us. I, I was doing a program today, uh, and we have to reconcile the scriptures. We have to reconcile the word of God. And when you can't, that's what leads to error. And regretfully, the same thing happened in, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 3. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple, it was Eli's responsibility to make sure the lamp of God never went out in the temple of God. But his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were playboys. They were religious playboys. They were living a life of thin theology with no conviction of God whatsoever in their lives. And their job was to help keep the oil in the lampstand. But because Eli had done grown old and his eyes had waxed dim, he could not see. So he wasn't aware that the lamp in the temple had gone out. And that was to never have happened. And, and this is what's happening in the church today. Uh, uh, people's spiritual eyes are becoming dim, and the light is gone out, and they're sitting in darkness, and they don't have a clue they're in darkness. They think that's normal. Now, I, I want to say this, and I'm going to close. We've all been to a, a fancy restaurant at one time or another, and we go in there, and our eyes have to acclimate. We can't hardly read the menu. Why? It's too dark. Finally, we, we, we get acclimated. And we, 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 our eyes are acclimated to the darkness, and we're all right. But then when you walk out of the restaurant, you know, at 2 o'clock uh, in the afternoon, and the sun's just beaming, all of a sudden you shield your eyes, you shield your face. Why? Because now the light has come on your face. You know what happened to us? We got used to the dark. We got accustomed to the darkness. While we sat in there, we got acclimated to the darkness. When we come out in the light, we thought it was... Uh, uh, you know, hard. It was it was uh, profusely stimulating to the eye, eye, and and we're like, wow. But what happened? We got used to the dark, and we thought that was normal till we got back in the light. And that's the problem with people who are sitting in darkness. Go ahead, Steve. Steve, I Steve, I don't know if you can hear us, um, but uh, boy, I'm you're, sorry. You're... Can you hear me now? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry, Doug. I hit my mute. Uh, the other day when I was waking up, or, you know, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes when I post, it's in the middle of the night, and if I just crash on my computer key and you see a period where there's nothing going up, uh, that means I'm just probably, you know, passed out of my key. I think the only way I learned to type is to read my forehead, Q-W-E-R-T. And by the way, I don't know how to type very well. But the, the, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart, and look, I want everyone to take this to Jesus in prayer, who are called by his name. And the Lord said, Steve, where would my sheep have any chance of survival if they don't come to me, if it were not for my provision, my protection, my guidance, and my anointing? So the point is, is that God's sheep, uh, I'm sorry, sheep have strayed, 
And I got an email today from somebody named uh, John. I don't know who it is. But everything that circulates, excuse me, everything that circulates around this evil day glorifies my enemy called, you know, the day of the dead, Halloween. And, and Jesus said, why seek ye the living amongst the dead? And I echo uh, what David Langford, Pastor David Langford, said about Halloween. It used to frost my cake, and I was pretty, uh, I don't believe in a candle. When a candle needs, you got to burn a brightener. I believe in a blast torch for the truth. I used to be a member of a board of an Assembly of God church after I got saved. And they wanted to have fall harvest because they didn't want the Christians to, uh, you know, feel out of place by their worldly friends. Well, uh, needless to say, that didn't go over well with me. And uh, uh, needless to say, it didn't stay on the board, David, very long. <laughs> uh, I remember they were praying to God. God answered them prophetically, and they just basically God answered them so specifically so supernaturally and they said well that can't be God and I kind of rose up and I said you guys you're all quote elders leaders of this church fellowship proclaiming you read the Bible you pray specifically God answers you specifically and so then you say well it wasn't the Lord well the reason it wasn't the Lord is because two of the elders had some issues with, you know, I'll say this, Amherst daughters, and one of them's daughter had just had an abortion. So I don't chastise for that. By the way, everyone who may be in that position, Jesus loves you, your kids have forgiven you, and God is excited to reunite you with your children. But saying that, here's the word of the Lord. God speaking about this hellish day. Everything that circulates around this evil day glorifies my enemy. This is a letter for my children. These days are dark, and my children have turned against their God. They are rabble-rousers. They want to cause me trouble and make trouble. I am sullen at the darkness all around. The darkness closes in over all the earth. My children embrace evil like it is a dearly beloved baby blanket. In other words, they wrap themselves up in it. They are running to and fro to grasp evil. There is so much evil on the earth that the people are completely dumbed down to what they are doing and how they have come to be so far from their God. Now remember, I got that word on Psalm 23 uh, days ago. Everything that circulates around this evil day glorifies my enemy. It puts him at the center of the hearts of my children, who I, the living God, created. Their focus is on him and the love of his ways. I am so sickened of this, I could puke. Now somebody says, well, God wouldn't use the word puke. Oh, yes, he does. I have a sermon, David, and I'm not a pastor, but it says when God vomits you out. And basically, he spews you out. So God's saying, it makes me sick. My children have slipped so far from me, they cannot see the dark tunnel. They are digging for themselves. They are taking shovels and digging themselves a gateway to hell. And my enemy is standing by, assisting them. Children, you must awaken to the roof. Stop embracing this evil. Let go of and quit handling this evil. Each day that you focus on my enemy, you are one day closer to hell. My coming is nigh, and although I know the day and the hour, you must prepare because of this day you know not. I will come as a thief in the night, and only those prepared will be coming with me. All those left behind will then live with this evil tyrant in full force. The day approaches. Be not weary of preparing for my coming. Only those who are ready are going with me. Now, when uh, and then basically, David, that's exactly the parable of the ten virgins, you know? And it, it, it's I, I think some virgins need some urging tonight to, uh, to get some oil. And so one of the things we're going to talk about tonight is this. Where is the impetus? I'm sorry, that's not the word I want. What is the impetus needed to take away the impotence that has so taken over the most amazing uh, act of God's compassion, mercy, and empowerment to bring people out of darkness into the light? Where is that? Where is that? And so, you know, as we talk tonight, Jesus, even though the disciples had walked with him, had talked with him, had broken bread with him, had camped out in whatever field they laid their head on that night, they still weren't equipped, even after Jesus sent them out two by twos to go out and deal with the world in his absence. And Jesus said, Lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. 
So, Pastor, as you look back on your life as a, a minister of God, your supernatural transforming conversion, what do you think it will take in order? Now, I'm going for the standpoint, too, Pastor David, that without the presence of the Holy Ghost and the power of God manifested, there is no way to overcome this world. So go ahead, sir. Well, there's absolutely no way to overcome the world except Jesus Christ live and abide in our hearts, you know. And 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 this is an hour, and this hour that we are living in. When we say hour, we're not talking sixty minutes. We're talking about a a parenthetical time frame relative to the time of the end. It, it is imperative that we have a a hunger and a thirst for the things of God. I, I was sharing with Steve earlier in the day, uh, Matthew five and six. Jesus said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, I had a, 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 a he's, he's dead now, a, an old preacher years ago told me, he said, David, you need to encourage people to pray that God would create within their hearts a hunger and a thirst for the things of God, the righteous. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I cannot do anything to, to put that impetus in you to say, I want more of God. God has given you his word, he's given his son, He shed his blood, and he's given us the baptism in the Holy Ghost. It is up to us to come to God's table and feast with the Master. Uh, Jesus told the devil in Matthew 4, 4, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If you come to Christ with a, with a, a, a true hunger and a true thirst, he will give you divine sustenance and supplement. He will not send you away hungry. He said in John six thirty five, I'm the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus will sustain you. Job 23, verse 12. Job said, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job understood God's word was where his life, eternal life. Now, I'm not going to get into it tonight, but I can prove to you Moses went 80 days. He neither ate, he neither drank. When he went up on Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments, he come back and he broke them, and he burst them, and went back up to the mountain again, and got a second set and come down. He spent 80 days without eating or drinking. What was his sustenance? The presence of God. That's all he had, and that's all you need. And matter of fact, he was so illuminated that they had to put a veil over his face because the human beings that he come back and began to mingle with they could not stand to look on his face, for the glory of God was illuminating his face. That's a man that had spent 80 days in the presence of God. Forty days, came down and threw down the Ten Commandments and broke them all, and then went right back up on the mountain and spent 40 more days and come back. So you go back to the book of Exodus, you will see the fact he went 80 days without eating or drinking. We have no record of him eating or drinking. But when he came off the mountain, he was radiant. Why was he radiant? He was in the presence of God. It's up to you and I to say, God, create in me a hunger. Create in me a thirst for righteousness. You know, nobody drives me to pray. Nobody drives me to immerse myself in the Word of God. Nobody drives me to get a hunger. I want that hunger. I want that thirst in me. I want it to be there to drive me to my knees, to drive me to pray, to drive me to call out to God and, and, and regretfully. See, preachers don't preach in a way that challenges people spiritually. I, I get so many emails and letters, and, 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 and most of them will have a, a, a connotation. There'll be something in there that says, you challenge me to a closer walk with God. Well, that's, that's, that, that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to preach in a way that creates that hunger, that creates that hunger in your heart for the deeper things of God. That's why there's such a shallowness 
in the church world today. There, there's a terrible shallowness in the church today, and it's only going to get worse. And and here's what I, and I told Steve this the other day. We were talking. I said, there's coming an event where people are going to cry out and say, we know that you know the truth. Help us. And they're going to turn on these other these other so-called ministers and ministries who have lied to them, who haven't challenged them. All they ever wanted from them was their money. They don't care about their souls. They don't care uh, about their walk with God. I, I care about people's walk with God. I, I, I hope I challenge everyone. I, I've preached my own self under conviction before and had to get in the altar. The same word that I preach affects me the same way. It is, I'm not immune from it. I am affected by the same word that I hear it when I hear it under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. It does the same thing to me. And I'm like, I need to get in the altar. i got to finish up to get in the altar because I need to pray. Uh, there seems to be no challenge in the world uh, or, or the church world today regarding that. Um, and, 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 and don't think for a moment the devil will not take every ample opportunity and seize it to bring in more darkness. And uh, I think it was you, Steve, sent me that article the other day, uh, the Lutheran Church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church, where they, they've lost over 2 million members in the last decade or so, two decades. And uh, they said they've, they've concluded the way to stop the loss of members and the loss of financial and tithing is to quit preaching the gospel. Now, you think about that. The answer to their dilemma, the answer to their crisis was stop preaching the gospel. Yet Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So they're going to take the very thing that Jesus said to do, and they're going to nullify it, do away with it. Well, who do you think's behind that? God or the devil? Is God going to muzzle his own word? Or is the devil seeking to muzzle the word of God? It is the devil that has got it in the hearts of the leadership of the Evangelical Luther Church to muzzle them and say, we can't preach the Bible no more. We're losing members. We're losing money. You see, what, what does that tell you? That tells you they're trying to build an earthly kingdom. I went to their website. I just had to go and look at it and see how cynical and ludicrous it was. And so help me God, when I looked at the woman, at first I thought it was a man, butch, short hair, big glasses, and a, and a collar around her neck. And I looked again, I said, that's not a man, that's a woman. Now, I'm not here to castigate anybody or anything. But you know what it said? Bishop so-and-so, so I don't remember her name, don't want to remember her name, but called her a bishop. If that's not biblical error, if that's not heresy, if that's not fallacy, I need to go back and reread my Bible and find out the truth. But 1 Timothy 3 and 2 says, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. How can a woman be a, a, a bishop then if a woman uh, is to, is to be uh, uh, trying to be a man? She can't because she's not a man. She's a woman. So a bishop must then be a, the husband of one wife. So it ha takes a man to be a bishop. Now, I'm not going to get into all the, the, the silly, ludicrous things that are happening in the church world. You, I see where in South Carolina uh, a, a while back they were ordaining transgender pastors and ministers. I'm thinking, what is, what, what is, what is that? That's, that, that? That is a distortion of absolute truth. Who, give, who gives these men this authority to make these ordinations? The devil. God's not going to sanction that. God's not going to honor that. God is not going to bless that. There's no way God's going to bless that. Yet they say, but like the woman, I'm a bishop. Well, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Ma'am, you can't be a husband. I hate to disappoint you, but you can't fulfill the word of God. There are qualifications for bishops. There are qualifications for deacons. We, God's word gives us the protocol how the church is to operate. But the more darker the church becomes, the nominal church, the church of Jesus Christ will never become dark because it's the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. But the more the church 
becomes filled with sin, the more men embrace heresy and fallacy. You know, I'm careful who I listen to. Uh, you know, I'm not going to call names tonight, but I want to tell you something. There's a lot of guys out there who are in the same venue that we are tonight. And that's all I'm going to say. They preach heresy. They preach lies. Why? And I got, my wife got a phone call today. And, talk, and this guy had talked to another so-called preacher. He told him something different. First Corinthians 14.10, and there are, and it may be so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. You keep listening to every Tom, Dick, and Harry, you'll be so darkly confused, you, don't, you won't know what's right. But you've got what we call the Word of God. I had a lady today said, I don't recall if I've ever read the second chapter, second Peter. I just exegeted it and we just finished up 16 programs on second Peter chapter two about false prophets and false teachers. And she said, after I got through listening to your series, it's in our church. She was from Illinois. She said, it's in our church. And I'm praying God will open my husband's eyes and let him see, which tells me she's a submissive woman. She's not going to raise up and balk her husband. She's asking God to show her husband. The more people you let feed you, the more you'll get confused about what's right, what's wrong. But here's the great thing. You have the Bible to go back and say, let me, let me measure this pastor, this preacher, this ministry. Let me measure their statements by the Word of God. And when, as, soon as, I rec as soon as I see these statements, having a modest understanding of the Scriptures, I say, that's, that, immediately I say, that's error. That's just, that's darkness. That, 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 that denomination needs to be reproved. Any, anybody that would ordain transgender ministers, that they need to be rebuked and they need to be reproved, but they won't have it, see? Because you know what they're going to say? Oh, God is a God of love, and God does not judge. My God, how idiotic can that be? God does judge. It's called the Bema Seat, and it's called the Great White Throne Judgment. And, and Genesis 18.25 says, Shall not the judge of all the earth do that which is right? There's coming a judgment day, folks. And you better be careful who you let speak into your hearing, because Paul said every voice has significance. It may affect you positively. It may affect you negatively. It may draw you closer to the Lord. It may draw you closer to demonic activity, because it's heresy. Everything that Satan does relative to deception is based on a lie. I want, you to, I want you to get that in your spirit tonight. Everything that Satan says, everything that Satan does relative to deception is based entirely on a lie. What did he do to Adam and Eve? He lied. He first deceived by duplicitous words. And he, he did that by lying. And she believed the lie, and you know the rest of the story. This spirit of that's why Revelation 21 8 says all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. There's a there's a special place for people who lie. Uh, hell will be full of of centuries of politicians. They can laud and extol uh, you know, Ted Kennedy, whoever. It doesn't matter. Liars are friars. That's just how that's how that's how elementary it is. And this is what's happening to us. I'm stirred up tonight. I, I reckon the Lord is saying, hey, you knock down this darkness. You come against this darkness. You preach against this darkness. It is because men sit in darkness that they don't know what to do. I go to my dentist. What does he do? He puts that big uh, light on my face, and he's got loops. Those, those are the glasses, the, the magnifying glasses. They're called loops. And, uh, and then he's got lights on those so he can see what he's doing. You go in to have surgery, they bring these huge lights to put on your body. Why? So they can see what they're doing. The first thing God said, let there be light. Why? Because it was void and it was dark. And, there was, and the earth was without form. And the first thing God said, he said, let there be light. What does the devil want to do? Put us in darkness. They put us in darkness intentionally because that's where they want us so they can manipulate us. You can manipulate. And darkness. Uh, David Wilkerson uh, wrote a newsletter years ago. God, I don't know how long ago this has been. And he talked about uh, when they put back seats and T-model Fords and they put uh, a roof over them. 
and that's where the term rock and roll came from. Uh, now guys would have a place to take girls and put them in the back seat and have sex with them, and the buggy, the A model, would rock and roll. That's kind of graphic. You say, well, that's vulgar. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. And, 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 this is, and where does it all happen? Under the cover of darkness. All of these evil deeds and things that take place, the, 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 the wicked handshakes, the wicked deals, it's the, the nightclubs, the, the Las Vegas, the gambling casinos. It's under the disguise of darkness. And never forget, Satan is a master of disguise and of deceit. He's a master at it. He has crafted that cruel element of deceit and disguise like no other person. That's why he can transform himself into an angel of light. That light is not real. That's not the light called folks. That light is kindled, and that light can be quenched. But no man can kindle, no man can quench the light of Jesus Christ. Nobody can put it out. But even the devil has the power to bring the light down from an angel of light and back to where he is, a demon out of hell. He has the power to do that. But he can also illuminate himself as Nahash, the shining one, and appear to be glistening and deceive the people, and the people fall for his lie. Folks, it's, it's, it's time to get on fire for God. We've, we've toyed, we've played, we've played church way too long, and it's high time to wake out of our sleep and come to the light. Go ahead, Steve. Again, I don't know if, if Steve heard that. Hey, Steve, he away from the phone. unmute yourself, brother. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm trying to mute because I get all of uh, you know Job's friends telling me quit, quit keeping your voice on. I just try not to uh, interfere with what Pastor Langford said. I'm sorry, Doug. I'm not good oh, on the mute. Switch. No, that's, that's all right. Sometimes I, I wish I could mute the people that are continually haranguing me over it. But listen, here's where we're at. No worries, in my no. opinion, I don't believe in any way, shape, or form, that that which passes itself off as the church is going to experience the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I believe it's going to be in the fields. I believe it's going to be in the highways and byways, and I've got scripture with it because God commands his angels to go out there. I believe there are people right now, David and Doug and Joe, that may be in one of the most remote corners of Australia, out back, whatever, at the mountain peaks of Mongolia. I mean, these are some people that I know that have emailed me when they come in. They say, we'll go to great extent to get you. And, Doug, this is how God is using you. Praise God for this. That they'll go to, they're so hungry for reality. And back to the uh, the idea that God, Jesus is a good shepherd. And I'm telling you what, he's had it. Because Pastor Langford, doesn't the Word of God say that judgment begins in the house of God? And one of the most uh, overt acts of judgment is when God writes Ichabod over the door. And ladies Amen. and gentlemen, that means the glory of the Lord is departed. And i got to tell you something. The word icky... Uh, or Yucky, I don't know if there's a guy named Yuckabod, but I can tell you one thing, there was a guy named Ichabod, and Ichabod means the glory of the Lord is departed. Show me any place that the glory of God is at. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about light shows and, and uh, theatrical productions. I'm saying show me where the place is on fire because the cloven tongues of fire are upon the rooftops. That used to happen. So I'm of the opinion, I don't mean to challenge anybody, but David, I believe that even the fact that you and I are allowed this time at the microphone on Doug and Joe's show is a fact that God is fulfilling that. And I said this at Branson, ladies and gentlemen. By the way, all the DVDs, let me say this, I apologize. There was a screw-up. They're all shipped out as of tomorrow. Thank you for any of you that, uh, you know, should have any issues. I'll just email me and I'll forward it, but I want to praise God that we finally got them out. So, uh, you know, you'll be getting them in days. They're all being sent out priority and they just came in literally to be shipped today. And that's almost two or three weeks behind. But the idea that people are hungry, when we were at Branson, and for those of you that were not there, I suggest you get the DVDs because there was a powerful anointing. Pastor Langford preached his heart out. The glory of God was there. Henry
Larry Groover was in the foyer. I think the guy uh, prayed consistently for everybody, and people were hungry. They were coming up, and the number one request is pray for me. Yet God promised us that those who came would not precede those who got the anointing through the video. So, hey, it's real. This stuff is real. The anointing can follow through in any way, shape, or form. And if Peter's handkerchief could uh, effectuate such amazing uh, miracles, you know, was it Peter or Paul's handkerchief? Peter's or Paul's? It was Paul's. Paul's. I have. I forgive me. The Paul's. Then you know the idea is this: that anointing has a way of meeting. Here's the go. What Pastor Langford just said. Here we go with what he said. The anointing is always present when the hunger and the cry of God's people's heart is heard in heaven. Now there's a powerful statement I've never made in my entire life. In other words, when the hunger is there, that anointing, it doesn't matter. That's why people say it clicks in my spirit, that when it clicks, that means you were ready for that word of God to come. And so I'm encouraging everybody to get those DVDs. And David, do you, you know, share what your experience was there, because it was really cool, was it not? Oh, it was it was tremendous, and, and, and that's what the people wanted was a touch of God. I mean, Henry prayed for so many people, as you well said, in the foyer. I prayed for people. I prayed for people probably for nearly an hour after the service. There's not a lot of room down there in front of the stage. And so many people were you know, struggling with the flesh. Uh, so many people crying, said, you, you brought me back to the Lord. I came back to Christ. I've had one foot in the world. I've had one foot in the church. And, 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 and people are struggling. And, and the reason they're struggling is because they're not on fire. You know, uh, I don't have a, a special gift or special talent or anything. I just love God, and I'm going to fast, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to bathe my mind in the Word of God. And I'm going to preach the Word of God as purely as I possibly can. And that's what people are starving to death for. And that's why they came to Branson. People want to be ministered to. And... Steve will tell you, you know, I preached on the days of apostasy. You know, I want to preach many times. Now, this is David talking. This ain't the Holy Ghost. This is David. I want to preach in a way that blesses the people. But when, when I get in these venues, it's like, Lord says, you've you got to preach repentance. They've they got to get saved. And the blessings will follow the saved or redeemed person. The blessing will come. You, you can rest assuredly. You give your heart to Jesus God will begin to bless you because of your faithfulness. But he can't bless sin. So many people struggle in their relationships with the opposite sex, in their marriage or whatever. They're struggling because God doesn't bless sin. What kind of a parent would bless a child's wrongdoings? Well, we're no, we're no, we're no more than children ourselves. In the Lord's eyes, we're all children. We're his children. But then some of us become rebellious children. And bad things happen to rebellious children. I don't know how many funerals I've preached with rebellious teenagers, motorcycle wrecks, car wrecks, you know, because they were in rebellion, doing things that they shouldn't be doing. It, and, and, and when we become rebellious, it negates God's ability to bless us. He's trying to lead us to repentance so he can bless us, but then we, we fall off track. I'm sorry, Steve, but the, the, you, if you don't have the DVDs, get the DVDs. Each man articulated tremendously his message, his guideline, and what he was trying to convey to the to the people. Everyone: Doctor Lake, Derek Gilbert, Tom Horn, Steve, Henry Groover. Um, I don't know. I'll admit Tim Alberino. I'll miss somebody sure as a world. But, but do get them. They'll bless you. Go ahead, Steve. Well, no, no. Hey, David, take it away. Here's the thing that I think is critical. For 20 years on talk radio, I wanted to stay on the scene. I wanted to hang out with Romy in the woods of Montana. God bless you, Romy. And and basically not have to inter uh, relate on a personal basis with anybody. And then the Lord said, you know, you've got to come out from the wine press. And I said, well, at least there's wine in the wine press. I don't want to come out in the uh, meat grinder, you know. And yet here's the thing. It's when we contact each other. You know, so many people think that they can go on an iPhone, you know, and I, I call them idolatry phones. Now, I have one, 
and I'm getting closer to the point. And by the way, I don't take it anymore. So if some of you, uh, if I go to a restaurant, I go any place, I watch today in a restaurant. Okay, for the record, I did not have my iPhone. Every single person in there, with the exception of the waitresses, there's probably 12, 14 people, husbands, wives, sitting there texting others, not talking to themselves. The technology, let me put out something to everyone. You heard Dr. Baziago, or, you know, talking about this whole thing. By the way, he's a very, very well-respected uh, lawyer. The guy's got, you know, he's got his pedigree, but you heard him talk about Jesus, and he heard, you heard him say what he said, but here's the deal. People no longer communicate, but imagine there are waveforms of energy, and I know them to exist. And all they got to do is give the signal on a cell phone. They even made a movie about that. I forget the name of it. And it drove people crazy. Well, here's the thing. Everyone is married to their phone, and they forget what it means to be married to their spouses. And I'm not saying everyone, but the majority of the people are. And I just encourage everybody, watch how many people, if you buy coffee, I don't drink coffee. I'm not saying it's bad to drink coffee. I got fresh. Here's a true story. I got fresh with a girl one time when I was in junior high. She hit me with a gym bag, and it smelled like coffee. And, boy, that did it for me. Number one, I quit getting fresh. And, number two, I didn't drink coffee. It's a true story. But the point is is that we are at this time now where the interpersonal communication no longer exists. And, David, I believe it's an offshoot from the Lord. God gave us the ability to communicate. The devil gave us technology to break that communication. And the scripture says if we walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship one with another, then the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. It doesn't say if we text in the dark and have textual relationship, not sexual, textual relationship, that somehow we'll develop a uh, you know very close relationship. There are people killing themselves because they've lost their identity in a cyber world, in a virtual world, and they're desperately crying out for meaning. They're desperately crying out for contact. They're desperately crying out for something that they think is in a little, whatever it is, however many inches, two-by-four-inch box that'll tell them everything going on in the world, but they've lost the ability to communicate. And thank God, ladies and gentlemen, that God has made it clear, Jesus specifically, that his sheep hear his voice, and another will they not follow. I'm just wanting the voice of God to be clear. Doug, do we need to take a break? Or Joe? No, uh, Steve, we're we're going to okay. just continue to go till the end of the okay, show. Okay, well, I, I don't want to, you know, uh, run you through the break. So, David, here's where we're at. It took the power of the Holy Spirit based on the promise of Jesus, based on the power of God, to turn the world upside down. Now you have everything in its place, but there's no power of the, of the living God. And so as I see this coming to pass, and correct me if I'm wrong, it will take an event that will be, on, be, on, be beyond people's ability to deal with it, handle it, or relate to it, where they will be forced to call upon God. And there is no, and I can tell you this, I don't know the scripture as well as you do, but I can share this, that there is no place in the Word of God that I see where those who follow the living God ever got victory apart from him. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely. So go ahead and and share now. You know, you're, uh, how many years are you into uh, your pastoral ministry? Uh, have you been a pastor how many years? 27 years and uh, 12 years as an evangelist, seven before and seven since I gave up the church. So so, so in those years, actually decades, almost three decades, you've seen a lot, you've heard a lot, but have you noticed too, Pastor, that, that we're seeing now the great men of faith taken off the earth? And you and I had this talk, ladies and gentlemen. Dave and I are close to age. I'm still older than him. And what really makes me mad is I'll always be older than him. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, anyway, you add the numbers up, I'm older. But I'm looking at my, my end or finishing the race that God has set before me. 
And the thing is, is that there's so many people out there with ministries, and I don't care how big their name are, and usually the sons who follow in their father's footsteps veer so far. A good example is John Osteen and his son, uh, Joel, okay? Uh, a good example are swaggers. In other words, they're trying to walk in someone else's anointing, and it can't be done. And a lot of people uh, remark, well, how can you and Pastor Langford flow so easily together? It's simple. I don't covet his anointing. I wish I had his memory, but I don't covet his anointing, and he doesn't covet mine. Yet we both have our calling. Same thing with Doug and Joe. Everybody has got their gift, and all we have to do, ladies and gentlemen, is do our part. The word cooperate, the word means we operate alongside of. I love the road to Emmaus. It's one of my favorite, favorite uh, revelations because the scripture said, then opened he their eyes. And my prayer tonight, Pastor, is that God opens their eyes, that, that people will look back and say, on that horrid night, October 31st, in the world, then opened he my eyes that we saw Jesus. That's my prayer for tonight. Go ahead. Hey, Amen. You know, you, you, bring up, you bring up the road to Emmaus. And they said, oh, how our hearts did burn within us. And uh, you know, I love word etymology, and I studied the word Emmaus, and it means a hot spring. He, 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 he compounded that burning by them walking in that road to Emmaus, meaning hot spring. Uh, and his word is a, is a swell of salvation springing up within our hearts. But if, as we've been talking tonight, there's, there's an element that, Steve just mentioned the anointing. Let me give you the simplest definition of the anointing. The anointing is the Holy Ghost. Acts 10.38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Uh, 1 John 2.20 says you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. Now, the word unction in the Greek is charisma. But men have taken the word charisma and have eviscerated it and destroyed it. The word charisma, if you look it up in the Greek, it means the smearing on of an anointing. Uh, you know, I heard somebody say one time that Michael Strahan, the, the, the great defensive end for the New York Giants, had charisma. I think he's on Good Morning America now, one of those morning shows. I don't watch them. But uh, he doesn't have charisma. He doesn't have an anointing smeared on him because they've taken that word and they have totally misappropriated They have misused it. But the anointing is the Holy Spirit of God. That's what makes the difference. And the reason I bring that up, and thank you for alluding to that tonight, Steve, is because in Exodus 27, verses 20 and 21, God is telling Moses, and thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure oil, olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamp to burn always. In the tabernacle of the congregation, without the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his son shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever unto their generations on the behalf of the children of of Israel. So he tells them, you have to command the children of Israel to bring in the olive oil. And this had to be what they call beaten olive oil. It was made by bruising the olives uh, in, in, a, in a mill or a press. I, I saw one when I was in Israel, uh, and it just crushes the olives, and it, gets, it extracts the oil. And uh, God would not allow them to use heat or fire or any other method because the oil was a type of the Holy Ghost. And, uh, and of course, you can do other means uh, and methods to get more oil, but that's not how God wanted it. He wanted it to be crushed. And so uh, the light was to burn day and night. And what they were to do, there were seven uh, candles on the menorah, the seven golden candlesticks. And the protocol would be, and these were like almond bulbs, the protocol would be you come into the temple, you go into the holy place, which that's where the menorah was at the table of showbread and the altar of incense. 
and you would you would extinguish five lamps, and you would refill them with olive oil and put new wicks in there and relight them. After those five had been lit, you would then take the last two, extinguish the wicks, pour fresh oil in the lamp, the, the bulbs there, and then relight the last two wicks and put them in there. And so the light was to burn perpetually. And that's why I brought out 1 Samuel 3 and 2, an heir of the lamp of God went out of the temple. And it says there was no open vision in those days. And what that meant was no open vision. Nobody was preaching Jehovah. Nobody was preaching uh, Jesus Christ. Nobody was preaching the atonement. Nobody was preaching the Passover. They had just gone into a state and place of total darkness. That's what's happening here. You know, as far as I'm concerned, until men start preaching repentance, they're wasting their time. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know what they're expecting to accomplish. But until people come into a proper and correct relationship with Jesus Christ, they, 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 that's the foundation. That's, that's the fundamentals. Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, Luke 13, 3, nay, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Repentance is the foundation of building a relationship in Jesus. And you have all these hip-hop-looking preachers, you know, tank tops, holes in their jeans, all this silly stuff. Uh, they're just trying to be cool. I, I, I'm not trying to be cool. I'm trying to minister. I, I, I'm trying to get people ready. You know, when you stand by deathbeds and watch people die, when you conduct funerals, funerals of people who've committed suicide, people who've been killed in motorcycle wrecks, people who've been killed in car accidents, you name it, I've done it. You, when you have to face that on a regular basis, you understand what is important. You understand, because see, I have this, this I don't want to use the word fear, I have this reverence that when anybody that I know in any way, and they pass away, my first thought is, where are they? They went somewhere into eternity. My first, I don't care if it's uh, somebody I knew in high school. My first thought always is, where did they go? Because they went somewhere. Lazarus went to paradise, Abraham's bosom, the rich man died, he went to hell. You go one or two places. It is such a fearful thing, Hebrews 10, 31, Paul said, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. We're all subject to God, but God's not going to make you serve him. I serve the Lord because I want to. I thank God personally. He never gave up on me. Had I been God, I'd have said, Lankford, he ain't worth saving. Let him die and go to hell. I don't care about him anymore. I've called and called and called and pled and begged, and he, he just keeps on running around like a rebellious idiot. Thank God he didn't give up on me. I, 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 as I said, I've had, I've had friends killed in car wrecks in high school, all sorts of sordid, terrible things. You name it, I've, I've seen it, been there. And I, and I always, where do they go? You know, if a man is not right with God, where does he go? You, you, people say, well, you, you can't say he went to hell. No, I can't say that personally. But his lifestyle, you know, was, was, was he a drunkard? Was he a fornicator? Was he effeminate? Was he abuser of himself with mankind? That is the personification of a sodomite, an abuser of themselves with mankind, 1 Corinthians 6 and 9. Then when Paul said effeminate, that's catamites. That's men having sex with little boys. No, the little boy didn't go to hell, but the adult man, that pedophile, is the one that loses out with God. You say, well, how can you say that? Because Paul said, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he goes into idolaters, adulterers, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. He said, hey, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And so when you look at people's lifestyle, you have to question if they did die, and they died being one of those persons like that, where did they go? Paul said they didn't inherit the kingdom of God. And, and so it, it, it's sobering to me. It's tremendously sobering to me when I look at these things because I'm concerned. You know, Steve and I were talking uh, today on the phone, 
uh, and, and the subject came up about the iPhone, how it dictates people's lives. It controls them. Now, they say, no, I'm not addicted. They're in denial. They are in absolute denial. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul said, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Of course, he's talking about meats and drinks and things of that nature. My point is, that they didn't have iPhones back then. But that iPhone usurps your time of prayer, your time of uh, reading the Bible. Uh, I'm like Steve. I don't take mine to the restaurant. Uh, in Branson, my phone stayed at the motel all the time. I never brought it to the uh, to the, uh, uh, the the meeting room ever, uh, as far as I can recall, because it's not important to me at that time. What is important to me is those souls that are there who need the touch of Jesus on their lives. You know, it, it's it's where I prioritize anything. And and it's sad. It, it is so sad how terribly prioritized we are. You know, the first thing in our lives should be Jesus Christ. That, that, that should have absolute preeminence over everything. You cannot be a good businessman. You cannot be a good husband unless you're a good Christian. You, you know, your work and labor is in vain because if you're a sinner, you're going to do things that, that will naturally grieve your, your wife, the uh, people you work with, it, it'll affect you negatively because sin has dominion over your life. And so your decisions will not be correct. Uh, if, if you had God in your life, you would not maybe say that or do that. Most time you wouldn't say that. You wouldn't do that. But when you're a sinner and you do that, that's just the normal way. That's just the way it is. And, 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 and so many people in life have gotten married and said, I'll, I'll change her, I'll change him. And it never happened. I had a I had a guy who attended my church one time, and he was a Protestant. He married a, a Catholic girl. And the the priest, the priest told him, he said, Sir, you're going to have marital strife and problems. Your fiance has told me she wants her children raised Catholic. You want them raised as Protestants. The guy was coming to my church, had been married something like 12 years. He said, it's been 12 years of hell. Even God had given that Catholic priest common sense to help him, to help that man not do the wrong thing. But he did it anyway. And, and, and so how many times has God put up roadblocks in our lives and we were determined to get around it one way or another? Didn't matter who we had to hurt, what we had to do. That's called selfishness slash covetousness. I'm going to get it one way or the other. It doesn't matter how I do it, but I'm going to do it. You know, and uh, when you fall in love with Jesus, you'll always be consistent in saying, God, I want your will to be done. I, I, I don't want to make this happen. I have a little cliche. I don't ring any bells. I don't turn any screws. I don't blow any whistles. I let God do these things because God's going to do it right. Do I get impatient sometimes? Ask my wife. She'll be the first to tell you I get impatient. I like things to happen, happen quickly, and, and, and happen correctly in the sense it works right. It's not an aberration. It's not an anomaly. That's one of my weaknesses of trying to move and just, you know, God help me, because I want to see productivity as quickly as possible. My point is, in your patience, possess you your souls, Jesus said in Luke twenty one nineteen. And sometimes you can lose your patience, which in return can cause you to lose your soul. You know, I, I believe in, in temporary insanity. I believe people can get so angry, so mad, so volatile that for, for a parenthetical time, they, they've lost the reality of what's going on, and they take matters into their own hand. After it's over, with, there's this terrible remorse and guilt. Uh, I, what happened? Well, you, this is what you did. You got so angry. And, and you can be, that's where the devil wants all of us. Sin is insane. Sin is insanity. And, and, and so we, we teach, we preach Jesus, because I'm telling you, uh, it, there's something coming down the pike. I, I, there, I don't know what it is. God knows what it is. I don't know. It may be a, a North Korean. They may have nukes in America. I don't know. But God, it's not that God punishes us. God does not punish people in that sense. It's the devil. God just removes his hand. God, God, he loves us. He will chasten us, and he will correct us. 
But to, 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 to beat us up with a 9-11, that's not what God does. That's the work of the devil. And when you read the book of Job, and you see all the things that happened to Job, God didn't do any of that. God didn't do any of that. It was the devil. It was the devil. Uh, when, when there came a messenger, you know, to Job, and he said, Job, your oxen were plowing, and your asses were feeding beside them, and the fire of God fell out of heaven, consumed them all. He said, the Sabaeans fell, took your servants away, killed them. And everything that was happening was the devil, this, this terrible storm that came out of the uh, four corners of the earth. And it hit uh, Job's eldest son's house and killed all his children. That wasn't God. That was the devil. And then in the second encounter with Satan and God, in Job 2 and 6, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he, Job, is in thine hand, but save his life. What did the devil do next? He smote Job with boils from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. Did God do that? No, the devil did. And, and, and this is the kind of trust that God had with Job and that he allowed Job to be placed in the hand of the devil. He is in thine hand, but save his life. So the devil only had so much room he could go, but he did everything he could to destroy him. But again, my point is, God had nothing to do with that. It is always the devil. He's the one that kills, steals, and destroys. 9-11 was not the judgment of God, per se. It's that God pulled back his hand, and now the devil has free course. He can now come in and maim the sheep. He can slaughter the sheep. He can slaughter the lambs. He can do what he wills. Why? Because God has said, you don't want me? I'll give you what you want, just like Israel. They were murmured, they bickered, they complained. They said, we don't even have any flesh to eat. And so God sent quails, and he sent so many, the, 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 the flesh of the quails came out their nostrils. You know, I mean, God can get fed up with us and, and just turn and walk away and, and leave us to our own devices. But God made a promise to Solomon and the dedication of the temple. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. If it's not God's way, it's a wicked way. If they will turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. Now, Donald Trump gets blamed for a lot of division. Listen, he fell into this because of the way the previous administration done things. There were so many underhanded deals, and they remain to that degree to this day. The darkness, the secret deals, they, they're there. I believe God's going to allow them to come to light. I believe with all of my heart that I, I, I heard from the Lord the other day, with this Mueller being the FBI director in 2009, Barack Hussein Obama working with the Iranian nuclear deal, and this uranium that was sold to Russia is all about one thing at the end of the day. And I've not heard anybody say anything about it. It's about destroying Israel. Russia has always been a, a great supporter of Iran. Obama is a Muslim. Say what you will. You can hate me. You can shoot me hateful emails and letters. Don't bother wasting your time. Bayrak. Hussein Obama. If that's not Islamic, somebody help me. This is what's going, this is the vile, this is the darkness Steve and I are talking about. This is the darkness, folks. You got a, you got a special investigator, prosecutor, Mueller, today, looking at this stuff. He was the FBI director when all this stuff was going on with this uranium stuff. And Obama's trying to cut a deal with Iran. And Israel's pleading, for God's sake, stop this nonsense. So you've got to look through the darkness and say, wait a minute, what's this all about? It's all about the destruction of Israel and Jerusalem at the end of the day, because that's where the Antichrist is going, folks. He's going and they're going to establish his temple uh, it, between the holy mountains. Why? Because that's what he has been ordained to do in fulfilling the scriptures. And he's, he's, he's going to, to, to go into the Middle East. 
And uh, uh, Daniel 11, 45, and he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help it. This is coming. This is coming. Now, uh, we've all, to some degree, have been guilty of talking about a new world order. The new world order will never come to full fruition. It will come to some degree, but it will never become fully blown, because even the Antichrist is going to have trouble from the north. And uh, it's going to it's going to change his plans. See, and uh, uh, when the, the the tidings out of the east and and out of the north shall trouble him, and he'll go forth. The Bible says, uh, with great fury to destroy or to make war and utterly to make away many. And it says to make away or take away many. That's what he's going to do. Uh, he, he's going to create havoc in the earth, but he'll he'll not accomplish the entirety of it. When Doctor Henry Spake, one of the founding fathers of the United Nations said, we need a man, whether he be sent from God or the devil, to run the world. He was talking about the Antichrist. But the devil will never get control of the entire world and set up his satanic kingdom. He's working to that end, but God will stop it, see? And, uh, and, and all this is taking place before us. And, you know, here's, here's, the, here's the problem. I'll give it back to you, Steve. People are sitting in darkness. These charlatans, these hirelings are standing in the pulpit, and they're not telling their church what's coming. They'd rather preach, think better, live better, than tell them there's a man, the son of perdition, that the Bible says is going to come to to fruition. He's going to be an evil person. He's going to understand dark sentences. Why? He is anointed with a satanic anointing to understand these dark things. I, I don't want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of the light of Jesus Christ. Stephen, we'll give it back to you, sir. Well, you know, with everything going on, ladies and gentlemen, the personal monitoring of our thoughts, our DNA, every single aspect of our being is putting under a microscope. And if you want to see how, like Pavlov's dogs, we all have become even acclimated to the electronic frontier, you can get a feel for it by just exactly how many iPhones I have been sold. I think somebody can correct me. I'm going by memory, but isn't it a 1.5 billion? Send me an email if I'm off on that. But that means one sixth of the world's population. If it is one, I'm sorry. If it's one billion, it's about a sixth of the population. One and a half billion, it's about a quarter of the population have purchased iPhones. And what most people don't know is Apple. If you if you look at the Apple, I mean, I have an Apple computer I'm looking at right now, and it's got a bite out of the Apple. I believe the Apple computers first came out at $666, the knowledge of good and evil. And the knowledge of good and evil is so now ingrained in us that the transition to the mark of the beast is going to be not any longer, you know, a long, drawn-out process. All it takes is the right world situation. Everything's already in place. I remember, David, you probably remember this, too, when Willard Canelon wrote the book, The Day the Dollar Dies, and Mary yeah. Stuart Ralphie, uh, When Your Money Fails. This is probably almost, oh, good night, 40 years ago. And that was the time when David Wilkerson was writing The Vision, and everything pointed to these times. But now everything is in play. And I want to I want to go to Revelation 13, and obviously I think people need to understand what is happening, okay? Now we've got an AI god in formation, artificial intelligence. It will not stay AI. They're already finding that there is a non-definable presence in some of the programs. They're rewriting their own code, and they're also speaking a developed language that even the programmers cannot understand. Let me make it simple. It's demons speaking the equivalent of pig Latin, and unfortunately, computer programs don't know demonic pig Latin. It'll take a certain age group to understand pig Latin. So I want to start out, and I want to start out with, uh, let me see here, uh, verse 11. Revelation, yes, I'm sorry, Revelation 13, verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. 
And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image of the beast which he had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now here are the, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no many men, excuse me, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast and the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. So many people have fought over the horns. So many people have fought over the mark of the beast. The Seventh-day Adventists, uh, you know, claim it's a Sunday law. There couldn't be anything more foolish than that. I'm sorry if that's offended, but the Sunday law has no application to a completely uh, godless society that, that's open 24 hours a day. But we're at the point, the and I, I overuse this term, but I'll use it again. Uh, how about this? The ultimate bottom, bottom line is that people will not be able to hold on to their faith and hold on to their position in the world, their provision in the world. And one of the greatest revelations, I believe, the graciousness of the mercy of God to the penultimate sinner, that would be me, was when I've asked the Lord, Lord, when does everything really begin to shake, rattle, and roll? And I don't mean in the sense of, you know, the back seat of a car and passion unbridled, uh, you know, in a fit of fornication. But what I'm talking about is it's obvious that a series of events will be created. Like you say, David, you don't know what's coming. Everybody knows that something really big and really bad is coming, but at this point, God has not given anybody. Now, I know there want to be prophets, claim to be prophets, uh, you know, and by the way, most of them were wrong on the rapture. They continue to be wrong on the rapture ready, and I say this, I pray that those who continue to read rapture ready don't mistake rapture and rupture, because the only difference between rapture and rupture is you. Think about that. So the point is, is that I, and I'm on record from the time I first went on talk radio, I'm sorry, but this is true, that people would always try and get me and you, David, drawn into arguments on when's the rapture, when's the rapture. Well, God showed us both that there is no such thing as a pre-tribulation rapture. But people will hold on to that while losing track of the fact that they should be praying, Lord, I, I pray that I be counted worthy to be found in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I don't think that, and, and maybe you could speak better because you, you, you've been in a church situation longer than I have, but I don't believe many people put themselves as believers in the rapture that they could be put into the position where they have to choose whether they take the mark of the beast or they literally, you know, are instantly thrust out of commerce, are banned from medical treatment, don't get their Social Security, or let's just call it Antichrist uh, coinage. They don't get anything, and you can see it in all of the cryptocurrencies. You can see it in the whole uh, unfolding, uh, taking away the last vestige of financial freedom is the cash. So what am I saying in all this? I believe that the greatest revelation I got was when, obviously, in the book of of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, was when Joseph, okay, uh, is when the money failed after the famine, and we're going into famine right now. The sea life is dying, and I remember David saying that on the radio, and someone took me to task. The Pacific Ocean isn't technically one third of the world's population or world's ocean. I said, yes, it is. You didn't add in the Arctic part of it. So the deal is, is that what will what will take place? And, and my question is, Lord, it's not who can stand. I need to stand. And I think this is the bottom line on Revelation chapter 13. You can argue over the horns. You can argue, argue over, is it a laser tattoo? Is it a, a genetic DNA impregnation? Is it smart dust? 
Is it whatever it is, the technology? But what I'm saying, Pastor, is that people don't consider the bottom line. The bottom line is no matter what the technology is, you won't be able to buy, rent, sell, or trade. Is that how you see it, too? Oh, absolutely, Steve. And when you, we've all said, if you could understand the book of Genesis, you could understand the plan of God. We see the creation of man in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, and we see uh, Joseph in Genesis chapter 50 embalmed and put in a coffin and buried. I was sitting here already looking at Genesis 47 when you said that. And it says in verse 13, And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they brought. And Joseph bought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money faileth. And Joseph said, Give your cattle, and I will give you for your cattle if money fail. And so the money failed. And, and in the Hebrew there, it means to be completed or to be finished. The monetary system in that day failed. It ran its course. I'm sure it started again somewhere else following this great debacle uh, relative to this seven years of famine. But God had already warned the man of God there'd be seven years of plenty. And one of the great things about God is that God would give heathens and pagans dreams. He gave Pharaoh a dream. Uh, he gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream. But what he would do he would never give them the understanding or the interpretation. And like Nebuchadnezzar, he didn't remember what he dreamed. And he became very angry and called the sorcerers and the magicians in and said, Hey, tell me what I dreamed and tell me what the dream means. And they said, They can't nobody do that. He said, Well, I'm going to kill every one of you. So when Aspenaz went out to all the sorcerers, the, the magicians, and he went to Daniel, he said, The king's going to kill every one of you guys because. You can't tell him what he dreamed and what the dream means. And so Daniel said, hey, wait just a minute here, pal. He was the head eunuch, Aspenaz. He said, if you'll just give me time to pray and seek God, I'll tell you everything of what the dream was and what the dream means. And so God does that. He gave Joseph the interpretation. And he does that to authenticate his deity, his majesty, and to show that he is a true God. Because, you know, how, how can... I expect Steve Quayle to tell me what I dreamed and then also tell me the interpretation of the dream. I mean, that, that's asking a, an enormous amount. And I have people all the time who call me or write me and want me to interpret dreams. Uh, when God gives me an interpretation to a dream, I give it. When I don't have it, I don't make up stuff because I'm not a, a dream interpreter. I only interpret as the Spirit helps me to understand. And I've had that to happen even in media. Uh, but the point is, the money is going to fail. And when it fails, it's going to be like Steve just shared from uh, Revelation chapter 13. You know, the Obama health care plan was over 2,500 pages. In my book, Revelation 13 Revealed, I exegeted every verse in that chapter, and I got down to the part there uh, where it says, No man can buy or sell, save he had the mark or the name or the number of the beast. Here is wisdom. They have that understanding. Count the number of the beast. The word count there in the Greek literally means to compute. Now, here's, 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 here's John writing about computers, and you know, he's counting with pebbles and stones and rocks. Uh, there's no calculator. Uh, they may have had some kind of addition table to write on or something. I don't know. But my point is, how could God inform a man of something that's you know thousands of years out? Because he's God. God knew the end from the beginning. So when you look up the word uh, com, uh, com, uh, count there, it means compute, and it's uh, it's 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 fifty five eighty six, and as I said, it means uh, excuse me fifty five eighty five, and it means to compute. But then it tells you to look at fifty five eighty six, and what does that mean? That means a ticket of admission. Um, you have to have this mark so that you can be admitted into the system 
And then the third definition there says 5586 says look at 5584 in your strong exhaustive concordance, and it means to manipulate, i.e., that is verify by contact. Uh, everything you buy today in a store, it's passive in the sense there's a barcode and they shoot it with a light and bam, they've got it. But this is about manipulation and, and admission into a system. And um, it, this, this has been in the, the throes for many years, and the Obamacare was just another uh, spoke in the wheel to get us to another level. And that's, not, that's why my aggravation was so great, and I don't have insurance to this day, won't have it, I'll pay the penalty. But why was the insurance, health insurance, put under the auspices of the IRS? That way they could have direct control of your checking account, your saving account, your 401. They can put a lien on your house. They can put a lien on your car, whatever you have. And see, I, I didn't want to get into the system, and I'm not in the system. I don't intend to get into the system. Why? Because I don't know when the linchpin will be pulled and you're snared, you're trapped. Now, I'm not saying anybody that has that insurance is going to hell or that's the mark of the beast. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just telling you with technology, there is a system that is evolving. That's why it's called AI. Artificial intelligence, and it's all about manipulating us. And you get every time I'm an old guy, okay, and I get my power bill in the mail. You know what they want me to do? Go online. I get my telephone bill. Go online and pay your bills. I write them a check. I'm not going to do that. But what they're doing, they're creating a cashless society. And you, you call. I, I, I called a, a Time Warner today, and and that stinking computer. I hate talking to people that are not real. And it, it, you press this button, press that button, and at the end of the conversation, I have to have a real person to talk to because of what I want to do. See, I'm not going to talk to that computer because that computer cannot reason with me like I need reasoning. Even God said, come, let us reason together, saith the Lord of hosts in Isaiah 1 and 18. I want somebody to reason with me. And, and so they're doing away with all of this, and regretfully they're breaking down each generation uh, to do more of, uh, be involved more in the system. You see, they, they, now they want you to pay online with your, your phone. All of this stuff. And what the world does not realize, this is the darkness that's engulfing the world, and we're getting deeper and deeper into the system. So when they pull the linchpin, we don't know when it will be, what the event will be, or, or what will take place, but they'll be snared. See, that, that's, that's the devil. He's called the snare. It, it's a, a snare is a trap to catch a bird. And that bird has the liberty and the freedom to fly and come and go and do as it pleases. But when it is snared, that freedom is gone. And and who whom the Son hath set free is free indeed. What is the devil trying to do? He's trying to take us into bondage, into captivity. See, and that's that's where we're headed. We're we're, we're headed in that direction. And, and and my heart is broken because I see a lack of spiritual preparation from behind the pulpits today telling the people, you need to be getting ready. But they'll tell them, you know, you're not going to be here. And, you know, I just wish somebody would give me a Bible showing the church in heaven during this seven-year period. Nobody gives you any Bible for this. It's just all conjecture. Well, just, just take my word for it. Well, I had a lady. Now, listen to this one. You, you'll love this, Steve. A lady called me yesterday, bless her heart, and she wanted me to talk to her and her sister on the phone and for me to explain to her sister, there is no eighth day in creation. But her sister told her there was an eighth day. And, and, and so you have to understand the Hebrew to understand there is an eighth day. And I said, well, can you sh can show that in the, the King James Version? Well, it, it stopped at the seventh day. But yet she was, her sister's emphatic, there are eight days. There's no such thing, folks. But this is, this is, this is the asininity and it's crazy. It's it's really crazy that people will tell you things like that. And I told the, the, the lady, I said, tell, ask your sister, can you show me in the King James or any other version, if you want to go to other versions, the eighth day in creation? Because on the Sabbath day, God created, or excuse me, God rested. And he created everything up to that point. And on the Sabbath day, he rested. So he did all of his works, day one through six, and then he rested on the Sabbath. Where's the eighth day in the scriptures? It's not there. But yet, you know, wanted me, and I said, I'm not going to do that, ma'am. I don't have time to do that, number one. Number two, your sister's got issues, and I don't want to get involved in that. Anybody that's that ignorant 
that dogmatic, that bullheaded to say there's eight days in creation. No, there's not. See, uh, 2 Peter 3 and 8 says, For one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years are as one day. No man lived to be a thousand years old, or no man lived out that one full day. Uh, Adam died at 930, Methuselah died at 969 years of age, but nobody lived to the 1,000th year or ending of the full day. It didn't happen. And so even even Methuselah's name means when, 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 when this one comes, then shall the end be. And, and, and so this that, that hit, Methuselah's name had prophetic significance that the Noadic flood was coming. The Noadic flood was coming. Get ready for it. We know something is coming, and all we're saying tonight is you need to get ready because once it comes, once it happens, just like the bullet that's fired, you can't take it back. You, you, you can't sequester it. You can't get a hold of it. It's gone. And there is something seething, waiting, and all God's going to do is pull back his hand and say, let it fly. His covering, his protection. He allowed that to happen to Israel so many times. They would become backslidden. They would become rebellious. He called Israel a backsliding heifer. Uh, he, he, he just he said, you got a whore's forehead, and you refuse to be ashamed. And he let a foreign nation attack them and would overrun them. He just pulled back his hand. If they were living right, there was no way they could, they could win the battles they won. But they had God. God was with them. And that's how they took over Cana land. Uh, the Canaanites, they were, those were the giants. Uh, that's why they said, we're like grasshoppers. Uh, but Joshua and Caleb, the Bible said, was of another spirit. They knew that God would help them win. And the, 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 the psalmist David slew Goliath. And, uh, and, and so God gives us the power to overcome any opposition if we're living right and doing right. But regretfully, today, you know, people, they're going to have to get down and repent when this catastrophic event happens, but it'll be too late. Then there'll be too many people went out into eternity, you know, and I don't know what it will be and when it will be, but I do believe this, it'll be a, it'll, it'll be a chain reaction. Uh, it may, it could be a nuclear detonation and the currencies begin to fail and we go into another system. I don't know, but it will have a, 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 a domino effect of some degree all over the world. This is why, you know, John McCain hates nationalism. Uh, he, he, building walls, he, that's crazy, he said the other day, I believe it was. No, it's not crazy. God didn't give Israel the whole world. He gave them a piece of land from the Nile to the Euphrates and said, that's all you're going to get, Israel. God's always had borders. God's always had nations and separate. He didn't give Israel the whole world. He gave them a portion of land, even when they inherited the land. Each tribe got a, a, a certain portion which constituted the entirety of the nation. But he didn't give them the whole world. And, 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 and so when you know, Hillary Clinton and Obama and John McCain and all these people want globalism, that's, that's not going to happen. Uh, the nations of the earth will still continue to exist during the millennial reign of Christ. And in Zechariah 14, I believe it is, if you don't come up to the temple of God and worship God like you ought to, he's going to smite those nations and they'll have no reign. Go back and read uh, uh, Zechariah 14, uh, verses 16 through 18. And he specifically addresses Egypt. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague for which the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. He's going to cause famine even in the millennial if nations don't come to worship him. So, you know, I just want you to get right with God, because there is something that's going to come, and, and I want you to be ready. Stephen, I'm going to give it back to you, sir. A Amen, Pastor Langford. I, I, just, well, want to, I just want to throw go that ahead, in. Doug, you want to speak up a sec? Uh, well, well, first of all, yeah, go ahead, Doug. you know, I, I just want to say this, not that anyone, or not that you need my endorsement for your book, um, Revelation 13 Revealed, I found it extremely helpful in my learning of the book of Revelation. So thank you for that. And and yes, I, I do feel um, there's something out there. There's something coming. I don't know what it is. I And, and I think, well, everyone I've spoken to feels the same way. And I just kind of wanted to punctuate what you said 
by that as well. There's something in the offing. There's something on the horizon, and I think we can all feel that. And and that does, in my view, require all of us to to be more spiritual and spiritually in tune. Um, that's just my feeling on that. That's all I wanted to say. And and I thank you for your testimony. Thank you so much for your guidance. And thank you for your insight, both you and Steve. But Steve, I'll kick it back to you, sir. Well, thank you. One of the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the situations that I'm most concerned about is over the years I've been on talk radio, I've been warning that obviously, and, and look, I love my country that was. I want to make this clear. I've been pro-military all my life, and, and maybe to my through my ignorance and, and maybe misguided patriotism, but a change began to take place in the U.S. military. They started to make war on God. If I put it into perspective, it was U.S. Air Force Academy kicking out Christians, and I could be off a year or two, and then I actually dug so listening for warlocks, witches, uh, everybody, uh, priests, uh, uh, pagans, and the war was made. And I think you guys will remember me saying this, and I said, because the U.S. military has made war against the living God, he will not fight for us in the next battles. So I want to take everybody to Leviticus 26. And I want I want people to understand this. We've got our aircraft carriers, we've got everything, but it was intentional destruction of the U.S. military at the hands of the Illuminati and the Luciferians, starting with George Bush Sr., following all the way through the Obamanites. And by the way, the Obamanites, in my opinion, when I heard he was running for president, I said, he will become the Obamination that makes this country desolate. Remember, David, when I said that? And I yes, really sir. did say that. So, yes. you know, when you add the Hivites, the Uptites, the Perizzites, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Catamites, now you got the Obamanites. When the night comes and no man can work. I encourage everybody to take the stuff we're telling you to the Lord in prayer. Because every day, Pastor Langford, Doug, and Joe, I'm sure you get it too, people say, thank you. Now I understand what's going on. And so, you know, ask yourself this, those who criticize uh, P- Pastor Langford, myself, and, and everybody that talks about Jesus, Doug and Joe, uh, everyone who basically is giving you a heads up, ask ask them. They want to argue about the flat earth. Ask them how many people they've won to Jesus on that doctrine, you know, or that heresy. They want to argue about everything, but it's always a challenging of God's word at the basis of it. So uh, let me read this starting at, uh, let's see, uh, verse 19. I want you all to pray about this. Of course, it was said to Israel, but there's two covenant lands. It was the land of Israel, ancient Israel, and it is the U.S. And I will, uh, yeah, let's say this. I'm sorry. And I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. And your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. That's what's happening in America. And if you walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children, and destroy your cattle, and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. Ladies and gentlemen, you're seeing the robbing of us of our children by the beasts, the appetite of hell, in the abortionists. I make no qualms about that statement. A woman has no more right to kill an unborn child than anybody can just go pull the trigger on somebody and say, hey, they deserved it. You're still going to stand trial for murder and pay the price. Now, this is interesting. And if ye will not be reformed by, uh, if you, and if ye will not be reformed by me by these things, but will con- walk contrary unto me, then I will also walk contrary unto you, and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. Again, seven times. Notice the seven. And I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when ye are gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you, and ye shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. Forgive me, but Pastor Langford has been preaching about we were in bondage. Next thing is captivity. And what happens when God delivers you into the hands of the enemy or us in the hands of the enemy? We go into captivity. Now, listen to this one. Again, this isn't easy. I mean, this isn't Deuteronomy 28. Leviticus, what is it, 26? 
and it gets worse, okay? And if you will not be reformed by me in these things, but will walk contrary unto me, then will I also walk contrary unto you. And I will, verse 25, will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And where ye gather together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you, and ye shall be delivered in the hand of the enemy. Even the plague that's broken out in uh, the, off the coast of Africa, Madagascar, they're saying there's something different about this. I'll make it easy for you. 25 years ago, I told you, biologically engineered weapons will target specific gene types. Vladimir Putin today, or at least his stories today, is worried about the U.S. taking uh, genetic samples of Russians to use targeted bioweapons. No one else ever said that. No one else could have known that except the Lord reveals the secret things. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It doesn't mean that if you testify to Jesus, you're a prophet. That is a gift to the church. But it does mean that God loves his people, and he will warn and warn and warn, okay? And I will bring a sword upon you. That's usually war. That shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when you are gathered together within your seats, I will send the pestilence among you. And ye shall be delivered in the hand of the enemy. And when I have broken the staff of your bread, famine, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven. And they shall deliver you your bread again by weight. And ye shall eat and not be satisfied. Probably GMO bread. And if you will not, for all this, hearken unto me, but walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary unto you, also in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. I think that's the third seven. Now, here it gets gross, ladies and gentlemen. And you shall eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters shall you eat. And I will destroy your high places, Washington, D.C., and cut down your images, all the stuff that's there, and your carcass upon the carcasses of your idols, and my soul, God speaking, shall abhor you. And I will make your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries unto desolation. I will not smell the savior of your sweet odors. In other words, God said, I'm not going to remember what you used to do. I'm going to remember what you're doing now. And I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And here you go, again, Pastor Langford's word, and I will scatter you among the heathen, and will draw a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. So, ladies and gentlemen, if we speak those words, and this is why I say it's important for you to pray and take the Lord in prayer, and then you have all these people saying, don't listen to those people that are doomsdayers. They're just fear porn. They don't even understand the word fear porn is a CIA MK ultra term. They don't. Or they're doomsday purveyors, yet these are the people that are all headed to their bunkers because doomsday's here. Hypocrites, hellions. My concern is, is that because America has boasted herself in her military, and when we walked in God's ways, we could stand in righteousness. Now as we walk in the devil's ways, David quoted the scripture, the thief comes to rob, to kill, and to steal, and destroy. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, that's what the outcome of the U.S. military will be. And for the record, that's why these broadcasts and my website are banned on U.S. military bases. I am not a Tokyo Steve. I am calling them to repentance. I am calling them. Look at the great battles. Now we find out the U.S. War College and, and uh, you know, uh, West Point, uh, they're being taught communist subversion. Now we see transgenderism in the military. And 50, I believe it was either Doug, 50 or 60 generals said to Trump, don't kill the transgender man. What? Are they enjoying the delicacies of those who serve under them? Forgive me, ladies and gentlemen, for speaking to you that the truth – I'm not asking you to forgive me for the truth, but forgive me for not being able to make it real to you. Only the Holy Spirit can do that, and I pray that you take everything to heart that Pastor David Langford and I have said tonight, and that Dr. Uh, – excuse me, Andrew Bachago, uh, you'll be hearing more from him as we talk about Mars as it unfolds. Go ahead, David. I don't know how long.